So let's talk about routing. Um, routing is a really important part of any web application because it's how uh, the system translates a web request into a call into your program. So let's look at the structure of, a, of an address. So this is a, you know, a pretty straightforward URL. Uh, the first piece there is the scheme. Uh, the, the, the WWW consortium had big plans for the scheme. I think it's become less important because where it used to be things like FTP and Waze and all these things, now it's pretty much just HTTP or HTTPS because that's all we do anymore. Um, you don't really have to worry about that too much, but it's there. Okay, and then you have the computer. So this piece is usually taken care of by DNS. Again, you don't have to worry about it too much, but this is how we decide you know, how, how our call gets to the computer that's going to service the request. So DNS is gonna turn that into an IP address. The request is going to go to that computer. The next piece is the port number. This is how the computer knows how to route the request to a specific application. So 443 is an HTTPS server usually, but that port could be anything, right? We're gonna be using 8080 later. And in the world of IP, that port number is basically how the request gets from the outside of your network connection, the place where the, the request goes from the boundary from the network into your computer to your specific application. Does that make sense? Again, we don't have to worry about that too much other than when we start our application, we have to have a port so that the operating system knows where to find us. And then this is the, the service of the API call or the path. Now in the old days, this was actually just a path, right? It was a path on our hard drive to where our HTML file lived. And that's literally what it was. Today, usually this is more of a, uh, a service path. So these values are gonna be passed into our application and we're going to pick the rest of this path apart to decide which function is going to service the request. And that's the routing part. That's the thing that we're going to talk about now. This is, uh, this is the part we're mainly concerned with is that, that path at the end. That pretty clear, any questions about that? Again, hopefully a lot of this stuff, you know, you guys, you're system administrators, you've seen this before. Okay, so let's talk about adding a route. There's a file in our, in our default application that we get set up called routes.swift. That's where routes live. So the very simplest route looks like this. I would have an application, I would, in my routes.swift, I would have a function called public func routes. And in there, I would type uh, router get hello. And what that means is, if I say whatever my computer name slash hello, um, hello is the route. And so you can see I've got router get hello. That means that if I see hello there, my request is gonna be routed to this code that follows where it says rec in. So that's the code that's going to be run when, I, when hello is in the path. And then I put in some sort of a thing. In this case, I'm just gonna return some text back out that is the text hello. Nothing too fancy there. And that's the basics of routing. This is one of the really nice things about, well, any of these, app, uh, of these frameworks, right, is that they make a pretty clear mapping between the request and the code you're going to run when the request comes in. Does that make sense? So I type in localhost hello, and this code, uh, rec in return hello, gets run. And that's just, that's just Swift. We're gonna talk more about what that really is in a minute, but, but it's just, code that's gonna get run. Okay, oh, I've got some. So there we go, there's the hello route. Okay, so I could write an entire application inside of that routes body of my code, but that would get very unmanageable very quickly. So we need to figure out a way to manage complexity. And the standard way, what's the standard way of managing complexity in almost any application with the UI for the last 50 years? What's the, what's the model people use? MVC, right? Everybody uses MVC, and yeah, that's, this isn't a new thing. This has been around, Ivar Jakobsen proposed it like 50 years ago. So it, it's a, it's a long-term thing. So in a, in a uh, vapor application, you're, this is the way it maps out. Your model, there's a directory called models. That's pretty clear. That's where all your data structures go. Uh, that's the data that you're going to be showing. Your view, you know, which is your pages that are gonna be rendered, that lives in your views directory up in resources, and then your controllers live in the controller directory, and that's just gonna be standard Swift. So we'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, from a web page standpoint, 
you know, the model in view looks something like this. So our model is the data. And if there's anything to be learned here, you don't want to ever use the, the web uh, or the email address some, someone at somewhere.com because it's been compromised 83 different times. It's, it's a popular one. So test at my domain is also pretty popular, but a little less. But anyway, all those, uh, the, the actual email addresses and all those breach sites, that's our model, that's our data. And then how it's all organized on the page is our view. And don't expect much out of my views because I'm not a UI developer in any way, shape, or form. They're trying to change that at work. We'll see. So, and then our controller is the code that links those together. So again, this is just the stuff we saw earlier. But the controller is the code that says, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take this request, figure out what it means, I'm gonna go get my model, data out of my model, I'm gonna pipe it into my view and send it back out. So let's talk about model. And again, this is our data. And this is one of my favorite parts of, uh, of Vapor, because I think they did a pretty nice job on it. So uh, for Vapor, they use this, this um, library they wrote that's part of it, but again, you could use it standalone if you wanted, called Fluent. And Fluent does a lot of nice things for us. Right now, they only support SQLite, MySQL, and PostgreSQL. And if you're saying, well, what about Mongo? Well, Mongo's its own thing. It doesn't really fit into an ORM because it's not relational, right? So they have their, a different way for dealing with Mongo and Elasticsearch and all those. But since this is an ORM and that R stands for relational, we're talking about relational databases. Um, but one of the really nice things that, uh, that Fluent gives you are migrations. Is anybody here familiar with what a migration is? So a migration um, is something built into the library where if your schema changes, if your data schema changes, you don't have to write SQL to go change it. The library itself notices that the change has been made and it generates all the SQL to update the schema of the database. So in the case of, uh, of something like Fluent, where my data model is defined by the classes I create, and that's all, there's nothing fancy, I don't have to write any SQL to say, create this table, I just create a Swift class. If I change that Swift class, when my program runs the next time, the program itself will inspect the class and say, oh, they've added this field, they've deleted this field, whatever, and it will update my database automatically, the schema of my database. It's really nice. Any, any, any database library that doesn't, support, um, that doesn't support migrations, you should just run away from because they want you to do way too much work. So it also does transactions and things, although we're not gonna look at that too much. So as far as the model goes, interesting files that we need to worry about. We have this package.swift. Package package.swift is part of Swift's packaging system. We're gonna see that a lot. It describes how uh, how, what, what packages are needed and how they need to be compiled for a project. Configure.swift is the file that, where we describe the configuration of our server itself. So this is sort of the initialization of the server. And we'll take a closer look at that. And then obviously our models. We're gonna be putting models in the models directory. So the first thing we need to do is add package information. So this is our packages, that, that package.swift file. And you can see we just have a list of de dependencies and this is all Swift. They're not using XML, they're not using JSON or whatever for, for this, they're using just straight Swift. And you can see we have our dependencies and then we have the targets that we can compile for this project. So what we do is we add a package statement that gives the URL of the thing we want to download. And we can also put in a minimum version for what we want. So here I want Fluent SQLite and I want at least version three. And then at the bottom, we make an association saying, when we, when we create the run, or excuse me, when we compile the app target, we want to include Leaf, Vapor, and uh, Fluent SQLite. So in Xcode, when I say I want to compile that particular target, those guys are gonna be compiled in. Now in this case, we would never actually compile the app target. If you look at the line below, there's the run target. That's the target that actually runs the server, and it has a dependency on app. So when we, in Xcode, you'll see later, we're going to say do run, and it's going to say, well, run needs app, and app needs leaf, vapor, and fluent. It's gonna make sure everything's up to date, download anything that isn't, compile it all up, link it all together, and run our app. So that's pretty nice. And then as far as our actual data, 
uh, we create just a Swift. It can be either a class or a struct. And there's nothing fancy about it. This is all just pretty much standard Swift. We have an init statement for a, a default, creating a default object, and that's it. And then what, all we need to do is we need to inherit from SQLite model. And then this is one of those cool things about Swift. This is just magic. We say that we, we have a, we, we're going to declare an extension on monitored email for content and migration. And those, by doing that, a whole bunch of code out in the Fluent library gets stuck onto our class. A whole bunch of new methods and things that we never even have to think about, we don't have to write, we don't have to understand, we don't have to even know they exist. They get stuck to our class, and because our class obeys, we, we've, is, has been declared to obey certain rules about how it handles data, magic happens, and we now have something that uh, the database can, or the, the database engine can create a table from. It can take JSON, or it can serialize data in and out of the table for this class. It can deal with any kind of marshalling that has to happen. All kinds of magic happens, and this is all we had to do to get it. So I'm a big fan. So finally, we just need to add configuration. And for, for in the case of SQLite, it's pretty simple. So this is in that configura uh, configuration.swift file. We add the line um, migrations, add model. Well, actually, we're adding a couple of things. So we're adding the database configuration um, lines there where it says var database, database config. We tell it we have a SQLite database. We're gonna, we're, in this case, we're going to tell it we're just going to store it in memory, and we're going to call it that as SQLite, we're going to call it, a, uh, we're gonna, basically, we're just going to associate it with that tag. And then you can see down further, we have our migrations. We tell the migration that our model for this table is monitored email, and then we're going to use a SQLite database. And that configuration, those pieces there, are all we need to do to have a nice, uh, all of our tables are going to be set up. If we make changes to the class, the tables are going to be altered automatically, and we don't have to think about it. So six lines of code, and we've got an entire database system set up. I like it. Okay, any, any questions about that? Okay. So suppose we, our, our, uh, our application grows, and we decide we want to shift from SQLite to Postgres. This is our original package information. All we need to do is change the package URL from the SQLite URL to the Vapor PostgreSQL uh, URL. And then we change in the target name the Fluent, po you know, the SQLite, uh, Fluent SQLite to Fluent PostgreSQL. And then in our model, for, we go from SQLite model. OK, so sorry, we change that import to Postgres. And then we change the SQLite model to PostgreSQL model. That's it. With those changes now, assuming I have a Postgres database set up to talk to, oh, excuse me, there is one more thing, and that's the configuration. The Postgres configuration is slightly more complicated in that we have to give it a username and such. So that is a little bit more work. But nothing else has to happen. The same data tables are gonna be created in Postgres. Uh, we're still gonna get that migration uh, facility and our code all of our other code to access the database, to search it, to update it, everything will still work the same way it did before. So, oh, there was there one more configuration change? Oh yeah, for the, for the migration. Okay, so that's our model. Any questions about models? Sure. Right. Um, so Swift uh, returns are optional. So um, you'll see some, some functions that actually have return types declared. This particular function, there's no return type declared. It just doesn't return anything. So it's a void function. So we'll jump back to, okay. So any other questions about models? Okay, so let's talk about views. We use leaf for our views. To add a view, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Again, we'll have to make a change to package.swift potentially to get the, the leaf uh, module into the system. Um, 
we, we're going to have to add some stuff to our configuration, and then we'll have to add some leaf files. So package information, it's almost exactly the same as we did with SQL, where we add the line package and we give it the URL for leaf.git, tell it the version we want, and then um, down in the targets we have to tell it and we want vapor compiled, or excuse me, leaf compiled as part of our app target. And now it's going to deal with downloading the files, getting them all compiled, getting them all linked, ready to, everything ready to go. In our configuration, the only thing we have to do is register the service uh, for Leaf provider, and there's really no other configuration for Leaf. Assuming that we have the standard uh, project organization set up the way that Vapor built it, and we put all of our Leaf modules in that, in that uh, views directory, we're ready to go. So our actual Leaf template, obviously, is gonna be a little more complicated. It's kind of like, XA, or like HTML, with other stuff, right? It's, it's just like any other templating engine. So uh, the, the hashtag set values, those are for doing imports and stuff from other, or, in, or actually they're, they're, they're exports into other uh, modules, into other leaf modules. But our main body there is just, it looks just like HTML. One thing that is kind of interesting is we do have a four email and addresses. What's going to happen here, and you'll see this on the next slide, well, the slide after the next, is that we're, we are going to pass an array of emails into this template, and then for each line in that array, we're going to get that uh, table line that says the email address. Does that, can you see where all that's happening there? So, again, it's, it's a very simple templating engine. If, you, if you've used any others, you're going to learn Leaf very quickly because it doesn't do a lot of the things some of the others do. So then in our view, we have our router, right, that goes and gets, that, that routes from emails. So if we type in localhost slash emails, it's gonna route to this route. And then it is going to do a query on our monitored email uh, database that is all set up, right, was magically set up in our configuration. And we're just going to get a list of all of them, put that in stored addresses, and then we're going to render email, that email template, using that address as data. Does this code make sense? There's not a lot there, right? So we go get our list of emails, we create a dictionary that sticks those addresses in a dictionary whose key is addresses, and then we pass that dictionary into the email template, and then those values are gonna be pulled out of addresses, and we're gonna iterate over those in the template and get a list of emails. It's pretty straightforward. So any questions about views? All right. So let's talk about controllers. Controllers are where the real work happens, right? And so they're the most complicated piece, so, so it's good we have some time. Wait a minute, let me just, oh, perfect. So we're gonna add a controller. <coughs> Controllers are just Swift classes, yeah. So my, for my controller Swift file, I'm going to import Vapor. Again, remember Vapor is the framework we're using here and then just create a standard class called email controller. And then I will create a function to get my emails. And this is going to be basically that code we had on the last slide out in routes. I'm gonna pull that out of there. And I'm going to stick it into a function. And then here's an example. See this function, see after throws, it says throws future view. So throws says this thing could throw an exception. And then the arrow says it's going to return a future view. We're gonna talk about futures in a second. Um, but that's the return type. So, and then you can see the return, the return statement says it's going to return whatever this store address flat map thing is going to do. So that's the get, that's going to get our list. That, that is if, if somebody sends a get request to our web server, this thing is going to be called and it's going to render our email view with our addresses. That makes sense? 
we're also going to add an add email handler or an ad in, our, in our controller. And looks very similar. It's going to take a request. So that's, that's our web request coming in. And then it's going to return a future response. And it's just going to try to decode the, the request that came in, which means that it's taking care of all of that. OK, they sent us JSON. And in the JSON, we've got this stuff. It just does the decode, and it gives us back a dictionary. Actually, in this case, it's going to actually decode it right down to a monitored email, I'm sorry. And then it's going to try to save that. And assuming it was able to save it, it's going to redirect us back to our main page, back to the emails page. Oops. Whoa. I'm getting ahead of myself here. So any questions about controllers? You end up with one function in your controller for every web uh, you know, web verb that you support. So if you have get and post and put and delete, you would have four different handlers for those four verbs. And then we tie those together. So this is our old route code that we've looked at before. And we have that router get emails and we have all the code sitting right there. Well, we've, at, we've extracted this code out and stuck it in our, con in our controller. So we change our routes function to look like this instead where we get an instance of an email controller, and then rather than mapping those routes to big chunks of code, we map those routes to function calls or methods in the class. And that's it, nice clean code, easy to read. You can have multiple routes in here, um, pretty straightforward. So there's our router for emails. Yeah. Let's go back really quick. I don't know why I get that blank one. So any questions about how these guys are mapped together and how, how the controller works? Class with methods, we map the methods. Right. OK. So now let's talk about closures, because all of these things are happening. You've noticed everything returns a future of something. This future thing is really something that happens in the future. So all that code, whenever we're returning something that has a future, most of the code that, we've, that, that go in the function that returns that future is actually made to be part of the future and hasn't been executed yet. It's executed in the future, right? You see this all over the place. I don't think that code runs when you think it runs. And I, it was funny, I, we were, uh, some of our interns were working on a project, a Swift project, and they were scratching their head because they had this code that looked like it was supposed to be running and it wasn't running. And it was because it was this sort of kind of, kind of the same sort of thing. It was, a, it was a closure that held a bunch of code and was being run somewhere else. So let's talk about closures for a second. So first of all, let's do a quick review. Some of you have probably seen code that looks like this. These are lambdas or, or uh, anonymous functions or closures or whatever in Python and in, in uh, JavaScript. Swift has closures, but man, it kind of goes overboard on closure syntax. So you can do a closure that looks like this. This is a full on, we're going to have the entire function uh, there. So we have the open curly brace. We have a parameter list, the arrow and a return type. And then, in re and then the in denotes the beginning of the actual code for the closure. And then we're just going to return a plus one. So the stuff in the curly brace, that isn't immediately executed, right? That stuff is being assigned to add one. And then at some point in the future, when we do something with add one, the code might get executed. But that wasn't good enough for the Swift guys. They said, well, that's kind of verbose. Um, we can infer the type of A because we're adding one to it. The only thing you can add an integer one to is another integer. So duh, we don't need to declare it's an int. We can figure that out from reading the code. So the compiler will infer that A is an integer. It's still strongly typed, but we don't have to tell it that. That's still a lot of typing. So we can just kind of use the, uh, you know, the, the shell script syntax and get rid of variable names altogether and just uh, add $0 to 1. And it's going to infer everything else. All of those statements are completely equivalent. They're all, they all have the same type checking. They all have the same types. Just three different ways to write them. This can get really confusing when you're reading Swift. And to make matters worse, 
they have a thing called tail closures. So if I have a function that has a parameter list and the last parameter in the, in the parameter list is a closure, I can move that outside of the parentheses, but it's still a parameter to the function. So on that reduce call, you can see I've taken the $0 plus $1 and I've stuck it after the function, but it's still a parameter. There's no difference between those two lines of code. But in your mind, suddenly reduce looks like it's like a for loop or an if, and that thing is gonna be executed, but it's not. It's, it's still a parameter, it's still being executed at some time somewhere out there. And then to make matters even worse, if it's the only parameter, if the closure is the only parameter to the function call, then you can get rid of the parentheses altogether, so you get this map thing. So I have an array of one, two, three, dot map, and then I'm gonna add all those values, or multiply those values together. So, things can get interesting to read. And it's nice when you understand and when you're used to reading it, but it can be a little bit of a, of a bump when you're getting used to reading Swift. Is this all clear, what's going on? So a closure is a hunk of code that we're going to bottle up and assign to a variable and use sometime later. Swift has lots of ways to declare closures, and because of those, sometimes it can get confusing to read the code. So let's spot the closures. We're back to our controller. There are several closures in this code. So the return stored address flat map, that's a function call, and that open curling brace is the beginning of a closure, and that's the end of a closure. So flat map creates a future, and in that future, we have some sort of asynchronous um, event that's going to trigger it happening, and we have some code that's going to be executed when that event happens. But the return from get emails is not a list, is not a view, it's not a list of views, it's, a, it's everything we need to create a view sometime in the future, right? Along the same lines, here we have another flat map. Again, it's going to create, where this code, that code is not going to be run when add email is called. It's going to be run sometime in the future. That's the name future. So this gets a little weird because you think get emails is being called and the code uh, in that flat map is being run, but it's not. That code will be run when we get our data back from our database and that's an asynchronous call, right? Because database, database queries can take time. They want to, we want to keep our application responsive and running well, so we are going to take that database call, we're gonna stick it in a thread somewhere else, and we're going to return immediately. And at some point in the future, that database uh, call is gonna resolve, our, our um, data, our view is gonna be rendered, and that rendering is going to then be sent back out to the person who made the call. That's all done asynchronously, it's all done concurrently with other things, and we have no control over when it happens. Okay, along the same lines, on our, on our uh, add email, again, it's a database call. We don't know how long it's gonna take, we don't know anything about our database, so we're gonna package it up in the future, have it run asynchronously and concurrently, and when something interesting happens, the Vapor system will figure it out and it will respond appropriately. So this can be, again, this can be a, a, a little bit to get used to, but it's really powerful. Now, going forward, I suspect this is one of those things where the Vapor people are going to make us rewrite all of our code. Because Apple has announced these, this thing called Combine, which is now part of Swift to deal with concurrency, and it deals with a lot of the same problems that this future, this asynchronous package that's part of Vapor deals with, but it deals with them much better. And it provides some really neat facilities that uh, the asynchronous package in Vapor doesn't, but it will solve a problem we're going to have later on in our project. So I would be really happy to have it, even if I have to rewrite all my code to make, it, to make use of it. Uh, combine. It's actually based on an open source project called ReactiveX, which is an asynchronous uh, library that works in a lot of different languages. It's pretty neat, so I don't feel bad about, well, first of all, all the, you know, all the WWDC 
uh, classes are up on their developer site anyway, but, but this is something that's pretty much open source. So let's hop out to Xcode really quick and look at what we've got so far. So right at this point, the application we have is just keeping a list of email addresses. We're not calling out to have I been pwned yet, right? This is just our email addresses. So we will jump out, we will mirror. Man, I, oh, yep, see I did. I left my, um, oh, I left FanX up. I shouldn't do this stuff at one in the morning and not pay attention to what I'm doing. Okay, so here's our code. Actually, I'll kill it and run it. This is nice. So I can do all my, all my web uh, development right inside of Xcode, and I can set breakpoints, and I can set watch points, anything Xcode can do. So, so I, I hit go, and it's running. It says um, I can look at HTTP localhost 8080. So if I go to HTTP localhost 8080, um, and I go to the route, whoops, Emails, I get my little, my little web page and I say, yeah, we'll do that one. And I say add, and I say, up. oh, and I had a breakpoint set. There we go, demoing breakpoints. I totally meant to do that. Okay, I go back to here, and there's my email address. And I could add another one, so on. Magic, right? We really haven't written that much code. We've, we have personally written maybe, what, 30 lines of code, and we've got all this database stuff going on, and it's pretty cool. So that's all showing up, right? Yeah, I guess I should make sure that. So back to our program. Keynote. OK. So that's, our, that's a server, that's a pure server application. But Vapor does clients too. So I can make web requests with, uh, with Vapor. And we're going to use the Have I Been Pwned, uh, the, their web API. So making requests in Vapor is really very easy. I say I want a client, a web, a web client, or, a, or an HTTP client. Early it's a, I mean it's a, it's a network client. I give it my query, which is, the, in this case, it's the, the URL for Have I Been Pwned's API, plus the web address is the last part of the route. So the, the email address is the last part of the route. And then I just call client get. Now this is something I really like. You're always futzing around with headers, it seems like. Whenever you're making queries in other, other uh, libraries, there's some way you've got to add headers. And with pure Swift, this can be a real kind of pain to deal with headers on your requests and stuff. They've made it really straightforward in that you can just have a, a, a dictionary of headers. So if you've got to add extra headers to your, query, to your query, it's all taken care of. So this code alone right here will do the call we need. And if it were just getting this stuff, let's see, it looks like I have, okay. But, but something to keep in mind, this is an asynchronous call. What we get back from this is not a response, we get back a future response. Okay, so now we have this situation. Well, yeah, someday we'll get a response, but not necessarily right now. We'll talk about that more in a minute. So when we get our response, we want, we're going to get data out of that response. We don't have to, this is the JSON we're going to get back from Have I Been Pwned, and we're gonna get, we're gonna get an array of dictionaries and we don't, have to, we don't want to have to parse all this, right? I don't want to have to write a parser for all that stuff. So what I am going to do is I'm going to create a Swift class called Pwned Entry. It has an entry for each one of the fields in the JSON. If you notice, kind of interesting, this guy, logo type, has a string question mark. That means it's an optional because that particular field doesn't always show up in the JSON. It's an optional field. I tell it, I tell the, I, I make this guy, um, derived from codable, and I'm done. As long as I get the JSON response back that I expect, uh, it is almost zero work to get that data into this class. So all I have to do is know what my data looks like, write a, write a class for it, and life will be good. Uh, or a struct. 
So here is the bit to go decode the response. So let's see, make sure I do this stuff right. So I'm going to make my request. Oh no, excuse me, I already have my response. This is assuming I have my response. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to take that future. I might throw an exception and I'm going to send back a future array of pwned entries. So I'm going to check my response someday when it comes back to get my HTTP status. And if it says it's okay, then I am going to um, pull the data out of the response and then I'm going that bottom line return try entry response content decode. That's the piece that's actually taking the, the response data itself and turning it into a, an array of, of those entry classes. So again, a lot of the stuff that's going on here, all the, uh, the, the mapping and the flat mapping, that's all stuff saying, I'm dealing with futures, I'm dealing with asynchronous, so when you get the chance, when the data is actually available, go ahead and do these things. That's all that's going on there. It's a little weird to look at when you start, but again, working with it a while, it, it all starts to make sense. And that's why we do that response flat map. What we're saying there is when this response actually responds, go ahead and do these things. I don't know why they call it flat map. I'm sure, I've never taken the time to look it up. I'm sure there is some historical reason, but flat map is just a asynchronous map. It's kind of strange. So anyway, we're gonna, again, we're gonna get our pwn data, we're going to decode that, and then we're gonna return it. So here's the thing though, what we need for our view of our email addresses with all of the places that, that there has been a breach involving that address, we need the address, and then we need an array of entries. Unfortunately, what we're gonna get out of all this is the address and a future array of all those entries. Leaf can deal with futures to a point. So if I had that whole, if I had an account entry, if I had a future account entry, I would be fine. But if I have an account entry with future pwned entries, I've got a problem. Because Leaf could deal with a future on the outside, if, if all of this stuff was in the future. But having just a piece of our information in the future confuses Leaf. So we're, this is a, a place where I suspect if I got on and asked the Vapor guys, there's a better solution, but I'm just going to kind of uh, brute force it. So here's our situation. This is sort of the situation mapped out. When we call, make a call to get page, we have a whole lot of asynchronous stuff going on all of a sudden, because the call to SQLite is asynchronous, the call to have I been pwned is asynchronous, and the call to render it all out into a leaf page is asynchronous. And we've got to get all this stuff put together at the same time, rendered out at the same time, so we can give something back to our end users. Can you see kind of the complexity that's going on here? So really having to deal with all those flat maps and get those calls right isn't too bad considering the amount of work we're getting out of it, right? Because it's dealing with all of this asynchronous work for us. And everything's going to resolve in time when it should resolve. So anyway, so yeah, so asynchronous is building a chain of actions that will take place later. And I'm going to kind of do this brute force thing. I'm going to create an array of futures, each containing a promise that we will have an address to look up. So the first piece we're going to do is create this array of futures. Because remember I said, if we had the entire thing in an array of future, er, the entire thing as a future array, we would be okay. So this is what we get from our request. Um, this is just that, uh, that get pwned request that we looked at earlier. Um, we're going to go, what's going to happen here is we're going to take, we're going to get our addresses. So that's that first piece, right? Stored addresses is the query on monitored email. That's going to give us back our complete list of addresses. That's pretty straightforward. The first line, that's easy. From that, we are going to create a future with a flat map where we pass those addresses in, and then we are going to, for each address, make a call to this thing called get account entry. And then once that is done, we should have our account list, and we're going to pass that into render. Does that make sense? But again, all this is happening in the future. When we do that flat map piece, everything from the opening print or opening curly brace to the closing curly brace 
is something that's going to happen someday, and we don't necessarily know when. Okay, so there we go. That's what I just, I, I keep forgetting I have all this stuff highlighted to try to explain it. I will look at my slides better. So now here's the tricky bit. We need to create a promise that someday in the future this is going to happen. And this is where the brute force happens because I step outside of the async library I was, giving, I was given and I am going to stick this work on a specific thread and I'm going to wait for it to finish. It's the only way I can figure out to do this. So when I make the call out to have I been pwned, I'm gonna make that call and I'm gonna get back a future and I am, going to, I am going to stick that future on a thread and I'm gonna make it finish and get the result out of it. Does that make sense? So I'm, I'm kind of breaking the model they've given me. And this is where combine fixes things. Because combine, you can actually create a chain of these things and tr treat them like an array almost. I have a, an array of events and then I can do a map on those events and as each event finishes, the data out of it gets put into kind of a final uh, glob of information that I can work with. So the, the bit here, so we have, our, we, we have our new promise that we create, and then I'm going, going to return that promise, whoops, but I am going to stick that promise explicitly um, onto, the dispatch global queue. And that's that piece that's going on there, dispatch global queue async. I'm sticking the work on there and I'm saying, you better finish. I'm gonna wait for you to finish. And then magic happens. I'll be honest, I don't understand everything that gets resolved here. I just know this works and I kind of know why. But a lot of good things happen underneath the hood with, uh, with the asynchronous library. So let's look at another demo. So this is the, the whole thing. Are there any questions about any of this? I know this is kind of dense, and hopefully what I'm giving you is enough information that you, you can go clone the, 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 the project and play with it a while and go, oh yeah, okay, I'm gonna set a breakpoint here inside of this promise, and then I'm gonna run things and do this request and kind of see when things actually happen. So hopefully I'm giving you a rough map that you can use on your own journey of self-discovery. Because this, it does, it just takes some playing around. So let's look at another demo. Uh, and we're gonna go back to Xcode. Well, we're, we're already running, so we'll just go back to Chrome. So if I switch from emails, whoops, to a different route, which is, okay. So I already had those emails in my database. So now you can see I'm getting back my information my zepedebo at yahoo.com address has been in a few scrapes. Um, if I do my, my old land desk call, that guy has been in a couple. But uh, if I do, whoops. Last time I checked, yeah, see zero, that's good. So I have a couple of clean addresses still, that's nice. And that's it. So, so there, whenever I, whenever I hit return, um, the call is being made. We're, every time I hit return, this entire thing is being regenerated. So all the calls are going out for each address. The call goes out to the Have I Been Pwned site. I get data back, and I render the data out into this little table. So... I'm actually a little bit ahead of schedule, which is probably nice. Okay. So, all this is nice, but how many of you are running Mac OS web servers in the cloud? Raise your hands. Yeah. Um, Apple isn't really promoting Mac OS as a server uh, operating system anymore. And I, I don't think there's any cloud services out there that will let you run a Mac OS instance, right? As soon as you try to stick Mac OS in a Docker container and actually publish it somewhere, a herd of Apple lawyers would come thundering into your office to tell you to stop it. So if you want to actually publish this stuff, 
you're probably going to want to put it up on some sort of a Linux uh, container. And for that, we're going to use Docker. Now, I will be honest, I am not an expert in Docker yet. This next week, I'm getting a whole bunch of training in it. And I'm pretty excited because that's where my future lies back at Ivanti. Um, but I just did a, I did a Google search for Swift, or for Swift Vapor Docker. And one of the top pages that came up was this URL here, Docker Loves Swift and Vapor. It's a promising title. And this is more or less the Docker file that, that they had ready to go. I had to make one change because by default, right now we're getting Swift 5.0.1. So on that first line where it says from Swift 4.2.4, if I didn't have the colon 4.2.4 there, I would get Swift 5.0.1. And uh, the Linux compiler and Vapor, specifically with the, there's a library called NIO, which is this really fast uh, IO system that they have. There are some problems compiling it with Swift, with Swift 501. So I'm going to force it back to Swift 424, but it, that's okay. So I have my Docker file, and then all I need to do is run a, th this command line, and again, we've got some magic. So let's see if I can demo that. We'll see where my command line is these days. I think I should have. Um, oh, come on. I guess not. So we'll just. Now, I have built this recently, so hopefully it won't take too long. So yeah, so Docker starts going. Oh shoot, I gotta, I gotta share my screen so you guys can see it. You guys are going, what is he doing? So there's a guy on our team whose job it is to tell me when I do this. So I run a lot of our stuff on um, on WebEx, and I'm always I'm I'm typing away at something, and I assume I I, I just forget to share my screen on WebEx, and the guys on our team in Germany and England go, what are you doing? So it's, it's Paul's job to say, share your screen. So Craig, you should have taken Paul's, you should have said, hey, share your screen, Steve. So this is gonna take a second, but what's happening now is we've downloaded the entire Swift build chain for Linux. And now the, it is compiling all of the pieces we need to run our application. And, and again, this is gonna take a second. So if there are any questions while this is going, sure. Oh wait, I guess you're supposed to have the box. I'm going to relay it back because I'm a terrible thrower. So here, we'll give it to you. So is this on the Docker part where you specify your uh, Swift version? Mm -hmm. Have you encountered issues um, like writing something in a newer version of Swift and having issues compiling down to a lower version? Um, I haven't yet, although I can absolutely see that happening. I'm hoping, I need to get on the, so Vapor, one of the other things I really like a lot about Vapor is they have a very active community. And uh, I guess maybe as a, as a reflection of the community's personality, they're actually on Discord, not Slack. So if you go find the Vapor community on Discord, they have a whole lot of conversations on almost every part of it. And uh, I know that there was a lot of active work being done to make sure it runs well with 501 as well as 5.1. So they've already started working on the beta version of the next version of Swift. So I assume the problem I'm having is gonna go away. Any other questions about anything we've talked about or Swift in general or Utah? I can answer questions about Utah if you're interested. Yeah, I, I had just compiled this. I was hoping that it would, uh, it would remember that I had compiled it. But here you can see it's, it's compiling Leaf, it's compiling Fluent, the main Vapor library. It's just doing the whole system from scratch. So sorry, yeah, this is gonna take a second. Yeah, so we're pretty excited uh, at the, the idea of being able to start writing full-on services in Swift. Although, there's some, some discussion about whether 
It should be Swift or Go. We'll see. Both of them have their... Oh, there we go. Before I, before I get myself in trouble again. If I'm not fired over showing uh, code from one of our projects yesterday and then showing that, that uh, dialogue today from a uh, confidential meeting, then... Okay, so actually I can probably just... Ooh, before I do this, I better stuff my other server or I'm going to be complaining because I don't understand why, nothing, why anything works and I'm trying to give a demo and nothing works. And Okay, there we go. So it's running now. If I come up to Docker and I bring up Kitmatic. Uh, no, it's, it's not. You're just trying to open the wrong one. Um, we can see. There's our vapor server, and if I go out here and I do a refresh, my data's gone because it's a new instance, but I still got a, rec I got a re response. Hit that. So everything still works, but now we're running in a Docker container under Linux instead of under Mac OS. So that's pretty nice. Didn't have to make any changes. Again, I just had to be a little bit careful. And it's funny that the, the things I had, to, I had to be careful of are not things you would normally think of. Because uh, the, the Linux version of Swift, they are working very hard to support the newer stuff, but not as hard to support the older stuff. So there's a function call in Swift that is a way of rendering out a string, and it's called string with format. You don't need that anymore. Uh, I, with Swift, there's, they have string interpol interpolation. So you can just do these fancy string formats, and the string with format function is, is not needed anymore. But on somebody who's been writing Objective-C for a long time and started with Swift early, that's sort of second nature. You want some sort of formatted string, string with format. And I tried to compile that on Linux, and it complained that it wasn't there. I was thinking, oh my gosh, that's such a simple, basic function. Why isn't it there? And then I realized, oh, because they got string interpolation, and only an old fogey would use string with format anymore. So I went through and changed that, brought it up to modern, nice Swift, and everything ran. And I really haven't had any other problems with, with Linux, going to the Linux compiler. So that being said, for completeness, we'll go back to our slides. And so kind of in summary, Total, that's 178 lines of code. Not for what, not one, but two services, right? Because I had just the email list service, and then I had the Pwn service or uh, application, and they were actually separate pieces of code. So 178 lines of code, uh, a good chunk of that was actually generated by the Vapor system. Uh, it's got a good concurrent execution model, and I have every confidence that it'll get better when Swift 5.1 ships. Nice, uh, straightforward code for both client and server side. Doing web requests is really nice and easy. Doing the responses is really nice and easy. Everything's good. We can deploy it into a Docker container, so if you need to do it, you do it in production, it's ready to go. And uh, yeah, Vapor provides nice tools that hides all the nasty details, and you just can write your code. You can implement your service and not think about all of that HTTP stuff or JSON serialization or database access, all that stuff is put away from your site and you can concentrate on what's important other than async, which you still have to pay attention to. So any other questions? If not, thank you for showing up at nine o'clock in the morning. Oh, Craig, did you have a question? Do you wanna throw him the box? Yeah, just a quick question about scalability. So is that a matter of multiple Docker containers and hooking them together with? Yeah, it's the same as, as any other language in that web ecosphere. Uh, you know, actually, this, the, the timings for Swift in the cloud are pretty good, except for JSON serialization right now. Swift is kind of slow at that, but Apple has made some specific changes to the next version of Swift to fix that. So uh, if you take out JSON serialization, the ability to 
to um, service requests with Vapor and Swift is very, very good. And then, of course, you know, dealing with the cloud, you just scale. You spin up, you use Kubernetes or whatever to spin up new containers, and, and that's why you deal with scaling. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you for showing up. Have a good rest of your conference. <laughs>